If you take your Bibles this morning, go over with me to Proverbs chapter 1. The hymn that we just sang is considered by many to be the greatest hymn in Christian hymnody. And it's really wonderful when you stop to think about the way that Isaac Watts wrote that. Ordinarily, he would go to a particular text of Scripture. Many of you are familiar with the Psalter of the Psalms and the way that he put things together. And he would usually put together a particular poem about a particular passage. But on that occasion, what he decided to do was just to express his heartfelt praise and love for the Lord. And as a direct result, it is considered to be one of the finest hymns in Christian hymnody when I survey the wondrous cross. Happy Mother's Day. Ladies, I forgot to announce a moment ago, we have a flower for all of you that you can have or use or share with your mom or however you would like to do that. Very, very much appreciate the rights, Ken and Jean Wright, as uh, they are. They always have green thumbs. They're always doing a wonderful job for us, and we do praise the Lord for that. If you found your place there in Proverbs chapter 1, let's look at verses 8 and 9 and notice the parental aspect of this right off the bat. I mean, the very first thing you see there, he says, is my son. Now, just for a moment, step back and just kind of think about this. For all the ages, across all the ages, the generations, here is the God-given message put, as we will see in these, these pithy, poignant principles, across all the ages, this is like a perfect parent. Proverbs is like a perfect parent. And it speaks to you in a way that your own mother would speak to you on Mother's Day or your father would speak to you. Notice as we read this, what he says here in verses 8 and 9, my son, hear or listen intently to the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains. The idea here is jeweled chains about thy neck. Shall we pause together to pray? Lord, be glorified, I pray, in this service today. Truly the goodness of God leads us to repentance. And I ask your heavenly Father that you would help us throughout this day to meditate on the goodness of God that we have seen in our mothers. Undoubtedly, Lord, they made mistakes, and yet they have been trophies of your grace who have shown us a great deal about how to live life. Lord, move this messenger out of the way. Let the Spirit of God have free reign here as we contemplate your very words. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever been on a treasure hunt, uh, perhaps around the house on a rainy day, or sometimes you were out hunting Easter eggs or just having fun out in the yard. And you've played the little game where the treasure is hidden and the clue giver tells you if you are moving toward or away from that which you seek. You're getting warmer, warmer, they say, as you're, you're getting closer to it. And if you're moving away, oh, you're getting colder, colder. And that, that really gives us kind of uh, information. It's like clue giving that helps us kind of know, hey, what are we really seeking after here? There's a very real sense in which that's exactly the way that Proverbs really help us. The book of Proverbs helps us to know if we're getting warmer or warmer or colder or colder. And a lot of times the way it uses it is it will take you from something you do know to something you don't know. So you know exactly where to put your foot. You do know something about life, but where are you going to put that next foot? Are you going to put that, take that next foot and put it off the side, or are you going to actually get on the right path for the next step? Proverbs does that for you all the time in very practical advice. And so when you think about what we're doing today, it's very much like a treasure hunt. What you have in Proverbs is you have this, this wisdom, and it's uh, winsome in the sense that it's very appealing. It, it, it really appeals to you, and it seems very gracious you have this winsome wisdom that says, hey, come along and, and let's look. 
But that first, those first two words there on the slide, my son, actually appear 23 times in Proverbs. And that's what leads me to say that these Proverbs are like the perfect parent. Those of us who are parents, those of us who are now grandparents, have a question in our minds about how are we going to impart to the generations to come? How are we going to impart to the next generation those little uh, packets of wisdom, not, not long, drawn out uh, explanations and things they might, their eyes might glaze over and they might not even read, but how can you pass it along in like pithy, poignant principles that would, that would really help the next generation? That's really what the book of Proverbs is all about. And for those who will listen, those who are of any age who will listen to this, you'll find that Proverbs shows you wisdom. And as you can see on the scripture there on the screen, what's actually going on too is that wisdom is, is brought forward by your own parents. You say, well, pastor, uh, my parents, uh, they, they didn't really know the Lord or they don't know the Lord. Well, catch this. All of us learn from the principle of sowing and reaping, right? All of us have been through the, the UHK. You could take a t-shirt and put UHK. You say, what does that stand for? The University of Hard Knocks. I mean, we, we've all been there, done that, and realized, ooh, man, I wish I could just take what I know right now, and I wish I could just pour it out for the next generation. Sometimes you just wish, I wish I could just unscrew the top of their head and, and pour in what they need to know and then, you know, and then put their head back on. That's not the way the Lord designed it. He designed it so that in the words of this passage, they have to hear the instruction of the Father and forsake not the law of thy mother. In other words, they have to listen to it and embrace it and don't forsake it. It's interesting in Proverbs chapter 3 that it says, don't let mercy and truth forsake you. We, we usually think in terms of, well, don't forsake mercy and truth. Proverbs 3 is telling you that the Word of God is alive. It is powerful. It is in motion. And what it's saying is, don't let mercy and truth forsake you. So here the appeal is to basically embrace the Proverbs and, and embrace them as the perfect parent. <laughs> Think about that just for a minute. If, if you could say, wow, I wish, I wish I could impart to my children wisdom that, that didn't have any foolishness in it. I mean, sometimes we put the wrong emphasis on, you know, you put the, the emphasis on the wrong syllable and you, and you just don't say it the way you wish you had said it. That wasn't exactly what you meant. Or you realize, no, I was mistaken and, I, and I, I shouldn't have given them that message in the first place. But the beauty of Proverbs is, is that you have the Holy Spirit of God giving you these very words so that you and I as parents, as grandparents, we could actually impart these as perfect principles that the generations to come will find, you know what, that was an extremely important principle. I mean, that was exactly right. That's the beauty of what you're looking at here in the book of Proverbs. When it says, my son, hear the instruction of thy father, forsake not the law of thy mother, they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. I love the way that's expressed because it's expressed out of desire. Who would not like to have a, a beautiful pendant this next uh, Lord's Day when we have our graduation service in the afternoon? You will see that some of our students have these, these pendants uh, of accomplishment around their necks and there's something special about that, draws attention to that. Or like jewel chains that many of our ladies will wear that just really draw your attention to those jewels. That's the way he's depicting this here. He's saying, this is, this is what it's like. So take today as Mother's Day as a day of looking toward a gracious reward of, of an opportunity, not to do things out of just dry and dusty duty, but to do them out of desire and love and joy and peace and, and throw yourself into it. Over several years now, the way I have just committed myself to preach a Mother's Day message is not to preach to mothers, but to preach from mothers. In other words, 
If your mother could stand up here in the pulpit today and preach to you, what might she say? What is it that that she would want you to know? And that is the way as I've tried to approach these messages, I've tried to think in those terms. So ladies, uh, if I get something right, feel free to say amen and think about the way that you are conveying this to the next generation. So let me preach to you today from your mother. She has been there, she has done that, Believe it or not, she was once the age that you are now. I know that seems astounding to you, but there was a time when your mother was the age you are now, and she has the value of the experience, the interaction with the principles of sowing and reaping. Doesn't have the t-shirt that says UHK, University of Hard Knocks on it, but you know, she basically has that degree and she has been through that. Think about it then about what we're saying about Proverbs. And my appeal to you today is very simple. Would you embrace the book of Proverbs like the perfect parent? Would you embrace the book of Proverbs like the perfect parent? Because again, as you can see there on the screen, my son, hear the instruction. These are expressed by the Holy Spirit from one king to another king, David and Solomon, Solomon expressing them on to his sons. You can see here that these are really wonderful principles to help us find the treasure. How many of you, just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever participated in an escape room? I know some of you have, because I've been with you when you did that. You know, what, you say, what on earth is an escape room? It's a room where they put in a number of clues and you basically go in and the door closes behind you and you have only a certain amount of time and a certain number of clues that you have to solve to be able to get out uh, across the other way and the, and the way that you're supposed to escape from the room. Now, I'm sure there's, they have all kind of contingencies for fire hazards and things like that, but there are, it's really a fascinating time to work together with people and watch various people solve various clues in an escape room and you begin to put the answers together and ultimately you can escape from the room by the end of the specified time. And a lot of times you'll get a reward of some kind or get your picture taken or announced. That's a, there's a very real sense in which it's like this for all of us. What if all of us were getting into the book of Proverbs and, and every one of us were saying, hey, here's a clue over here. Here's how this one works in life. And somebody's saying, oh, you know what I found? I found another one over here. And, and that can kind of take us through and help. And when you begin to put all these clues together, especially in a Christian congregation like our own, yesterday morning at men's breakfast, we had a wonderful time of sharing principles from God's word. And we're sharing these principles with each other and saying, hey, here's how you could use this in this coming week. And what it highlights is that the word Bible, B-I-B-L-E, Somebody came up with this years ago that it's basic instruction before leaving earth, B-I-B-L-E, basic instruction before leaving earth. There's a very real sense in that's what you have in the word of God. You have the joy of working through this. So as you go into Proverbs, here's what you find out. You find out that this, this winsome personification, that In Proverbs 1 through 9, chapters 1 through 9, you see that wisdom is personified. In other words, it's treated as a person. And most especially, wisdom is like a woman. And by contrast, folly, foolishness, is like a female. You say, wait a minute, uh, which one might I be attracted to? The the wisdom that is like a woman or the folly that's like a female. And that's the big question in Proverbs 1 through 9. And it's fleshed out in other places in Proverbs as well. Which one will you be like? Will you choose the wise woman or this female who is full of folly? It would be very, very easy to only look at the outward appearance or live for your lust or be drawn away and enticed in a way that would cause you to go after folly as a female. But here's the problem. Wisdom, the wise woman wisdom, she's all about motivating you. That is giving you good reasons why you ought to do certain things because ultimately this 
woman of wisdom personified in Proverbs. What she's really trying to do is she's trying to help you be a success. She's trying to give you God honoring success in life. Well, what about folly who is a female? If wisdom motivates you, then here comes folly as a female. She manipulates you. She twists you for her own purposes. She tries to to, uh, trap you in her clutches. And so if this is making sense this morning, you immediately realize, ooh, that's that's a problem. I mean, that's, that's pretty serious. I would want to make constantly wise decisions. That's where Proverbs comes in. Proverbs really helps you to go and embrace this and look for it like, well, like a hidden treasure. You say, you said at the outset that this is like, you know, the, the, the way this all works together. How, how does this help you as a seeking your treasure? Okay, let's step back for a moment and look at Proverbs in the, contents, the t- context of all of Scripture. Okay, what do you find in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy? What you find is, written by the man of God, Moses, what you find is you find the law of God, that he is giving you the law. To a degree, it's history, Genesis, book of Genesis. You have a great deal of law. You have some of the applications of the law. The Deuteronomos, Deutero meaning second, namas meaning law. The Deuteronomy is the second law it's been described as, as it's fleshed out, it's brought forward and kind of fleshed out. Okay, so there you have, in the context of Scripture, you have Moses who is the lawgiver. What happens next? Well, it's really interesting when you begin to work through it. You have men like Samuel, and Samuel, we know, had the qualifications for as a priest and may have operated as a priest, but he was also a, a prophet, someone who helped the people really bring forward in a judicial manner, kind of help them to understand the law, to, to work it out so that they could kind of say, well, how does that apply in this situation? Or Samuel, how should I, what should I do in this situation? Now, by the way, you also had some fiery prophets who came along, right? Like Elijah, today in Sunday school, you're studying Jeremiah. And what are they saying? I mean, in a fiery manner, they are saying, thus says the Lord. And they have this wonderful way of just bringing conviction into your life. So in the context of all this, where does Proverbs fit? Well, remember that you had the kings and the kings were constantly leaning on the law of God, sometimes ignoring it, but they were leaning very desperately on the prophets to give them understanding. And for those priests and judges who would help them kind of interpret the law, you had kings like David. Now, what did David do? David, in meditating on the original law in these heart-wrenching psalms that you're looking at, I mean, psalms that were just full of pain, and passion and and praise those are very helpful to us because when you go back and ask what was david's david's devotional book most of the psalms written by david you know but also asaph and others sons of uh, korah when those were written what were they really doing what was their bible their bible was the first five books of the bible and that's what they were meditating on there's a few exilic psalms that you have later on but you have basically that's what they were doing And so you can tell they're wrestling and and just trying to think, how do I work through all this? Okay, now here's the question. In the context of everything else I just said, going from Moses through Samuel, the prophets, right down to it, where does Proverbs fit into all this? Here's what Proverbs does. Proverbs comes across like this very wise sage or advisor. Proverbs don't come out and say, thus says the Lord, doesn't do that. In fact, you can only see illusions, allusions, I should say, in there of going back to the Old Testament law. So where do Proverbs really fit in? Proverbs is like this sage, this wise advisor who comes along and says, look, hello, open your eyes, look around. Come on, open your eyes and look around and just look at life and listen to what I'm saying. And if you will do that, here's what you're gonna find out. 
you're going to find out, you know what, this makes loads of sense. I mean, this is what the old timers would refer to as common sense about life. But lately you're recognizing that common sense is actually very uncommon. But this is where Proverbs fits in. It's these wonderful, little pointed, poignant, powerful principles expressed in Proverbs that you can kind of get most of them in just that one little bite. Now, I will agree with you that sometimes in Proverbs, you have several verses and they are linked together. Okay, we, under, we understand that. But by and large, what you find is it's all right there in one verse. In other words, the whole context, it's right there in one verse for you to go, huh, how, I want to think about that one. I mean, that makes a whole lot of sense to me. And wow, wouldn't it be great if we could see how this all works out? What you're seeing in the scripture is wisdom personified. And certainly, most especially, it is personified in the son of the all-wise God. He came to this earth to die as your substitute, as my substitute. We don't even begin to understand life unless we begin there. That the all-wise God has sent his son to be your substitute and my substitute. And he went to the cross of Calvary to die for our sins. And he rose again in order not only to save us for all eternity, but to give us wisdom and guidance. You see us even in the book of James, that the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. You find this, this wisdom is just shot through the scriptures. And as we learned in last Sunday's message, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to humble ourselves. Blessed are the meek, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. When a person comes to realize those things, he gets himself or herself into the perfect position to really open his ears and open his eyes and ask, okay, what, what does this proverb really mean? I'll talk a little bit more about how to do that by the end of the message. All right, it's a treasure. When you say that it's a treasure, when the scripture says it's a treasure, what's it really referring to? Turn one page over in your Bible, look at Proverbs chapter two, verse four, and you see it's suggesting that you should seek something as if it were silver, to search for it like, like hidden treasure. And it's telling you in that context that if you'll get in, and, and it's almost like a, a miner going to work with his pick and, and going in and digging for it like hidden treasures, what you find out is, when you get down to verse 10, is there's no heartache associated with this. In fact, it's actually a very pleasant pursuit because what you're doing is you're seeking after wisdom. You find in, if we went forward in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 14, chapter 8, verses 10 and 19, chapter 16, verse 16, we find out that this is actually better than silver or gold. For those of you who are watching online today, the manuscript is there if you'd like to follow along with us as I list some of those references. So he's saying here in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. You say, okay. But you said something about treasure. <laughs> Where's the treasure in all that? I mean, he said, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. You might ask, uh, why is this thought of as treasure? I mean, when you get right down to it, is it really all that valuable? I have really enjoyed over the years uh, studying the, the history of the gold rush here in America and also uh, a later rush for silver that occurred in the Comstock in the Sierra Nevadas. That's one of the reasons this caught my attention. On June, June 12, 1859, six miners were searching for gold at the head of the Six Mile Canyon in the Sierra Nevada range. It was very slow going, and they knew what they were after. They knew what gold looked like. But as they were digging, they kept coming across this blue putty that was just filling their rockers. You know how this would work. They would pan or have rockers that they would uh, kind of filter the water through. And they were taking this blue putty and throwing it out and say, this is ridiculous. I mean, we're looking for gold. 
And somebody got the idea, okay, we got to go find out what this stuff is. What is this blue putty stuff? And that's why on June 27, 1859, just about 15 days later, one of them went to an assayer who could tell them what it was. And what they found out was it was some of the purest grade of silver ever discovered in the whole history of the world, or on the face of the earth, some of the purest grade of silver. And what were those guys doing? They were throwing it out. Why? They were in pursuit of something else. Couldn't it be that in life, that's really what it's like? That there's treasure right there in front of us. If we would learn how to pay attention to it, we could find the treasure, but we treat it like trash. We're, we're throwing it out. Why? Because it's not the gold that I was seeking. Yeah, but in fact, you could become extremely wealthy. And one of those miners was named Comstock. It's known as the Comstock load today because of that. Can you discern the difference between treasure and trash? This has been much in the news, uh, even this very week. There was a woman down in Austin, Texas. Her name was Laura Young. And in 2018, she was at a Goodwill store. I can well imagine after I use this story, everybody's going to say, let's go to the Goodwill store and find this out. She's rummaging around under a table and she finds this, this old piece of sculpture. It looks pretty old to her. And she looks at it and thinks, yeah, I think there's probably something to this. And so she says, okay, I want to buy it. She spends $34.99 on this piece of sculpture. Who would, who would go and spend that kind of money? You say, I don't have that kind of money to do that. Well, she took it. She's got pictures of how she took the sculpture and put it in the seat belt in the car as she was driving along and you know, she took pictures of this. When she got home, she started researching it. Here's what she found out. It was actually an ancient Roman sculpture. It was worth thousands. And I, I looked, I probably saw six or seven articles on this. I didn't see anybody estimate, but certainly probably worth thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And what they found out was, as they did the research, that this beautiful, incredible Roman bust, they th think it was a son of Pompeii, that that's, the, that's what the sculpture is of, it actually had been stolen during World War II. And the theory is that perhaps a serviceman went in and actually stole it and brought it back to the States. And all these years, it's been somewhere, and here comes this lady, and she finds it under a table in a Goodwill store. Everybody else looked at it and said, ah, oh, it's nothing. You know, it's a, it's a goodwill store after all. It's just like, you know, nothing there. And lo and behold, it turned out to be a treasure. Years ago, I was trying to get all my fishing stuff together. And I thought, I think I'll go to the big lots and just see if I can, you know, find anything there. And I, I had a particular kind of reel I was after. I don't remember now if it was a Shakespeare or a Daiwa reel. Anyway, I knew there was a particular kind of reel that I wanted. And I also knew that it ran at the time between about... 54 and 75 dollars which i didn't have that kind of money to spend lo and behold i'm in, i'm in a big lots and i'm searching around in the reels and i come out with one and it's the very one i'm looking for and i thought no kidding and, and i thought how much is on this like eight dollars <laughs> immediately I'm, I'm holding on to it look at both directions of you know don't anybody come and try to mark this thing up and i thought eight dollars oh, that's a really good so i went out and i paid my $8 and got my receipt. I'm out the door. I'm thinking, I can't believe this. I came up with a really valuable fishing reel for only $8. You see, the idea here is that if you would go into Proverbs, you could have discernment. Like that lady who went to the Goodwill store. It turns out she was an art collector. She had a little bit of training. She knew she was looking for something. She knew she was trying to find something. It's the same idea with those miners, those silver miners. If they had just had the discernment to know what they were looking for, that's what Proverbs is offering to you. Proverbs is offering you as the perfect parent who is always with you, as we'll see in Proverbs 6 before we finish the message. That's the way that it will, it will bring you along. It will help you. There's a sense here in which when you start talking then about the fear of the Lord, the great treasure of the fear of the Lord, you have to go back and kind of define, well, what do we mean by that exactly? What, when you get right down to it, what is the fear of the Lord? There's that picture. I forgot to show it to you a minute ago. There's a picture of the bust that she found there in uh, Austin, Texas, under the table in the Goodwill store. When you get right down to it, what is the fear of the Lord? Now, in your manuscript today, you can take some time to kind of read through this because it's been defined 
in various ways. You can see here that it, it tells you, for instance, in our verse today, in our uh, passage today, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. It's, it's the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. What does it mean when it says the beginning? Well, it's been kind of neat here lately with our granddaughter who is learning how to talk to hear mom and dad get her to say, can you say? And she goes, A, B, C, D, E. And she's going through those most basic letters. Okay, why is that important? If you were to go over to our bookstore today and you went into our bookstore, you would find some wonderful missionary biographies, some wonderful stories. You'd find books on stewardship. You'd find books on instruction in the family. But every one of those books has 26 things in common. And what are those 26 things? They are the letters of the alphabet that have been cunningly arranged in various ways to impart wisdom. That's like the fear of the Lord. Does the fear of the Lord produce this uh, cookie cutter kind of conformity? No. You see, when you look at the fear of the Lord and you're looking at the ABCs here, what it does is it, it can be arranged in various ways. It doesn't mean we're all exactly the same and that we have this cookie cutter conformity or uniformity about us. No, it can actually be arranged in a number of different ways because you're applying it to various situations. Which one's easier to follow? A set of principles or a person? Which one would you say? A set of principles or a person? If you say a set of principles, then here's the difficulty you run into. Let's say you have 52 principles, okay? And of those principles, which one should you apply in this situation? And you say, is it number 13, number 39? You know, maybe it's number 42 this time. It's a whole lot easier to follow a person, and that's the nature of the fear of the Lord. Because, for instance, in Proverbs 8, 13, you would find the fear of the Lord is to hate, and he lists various things. Evil pride, arrogance, either forward mouth, evil way. Do I hate? In other words, Part of the way to look at the fear of the Lord is loving what he loves and hating what he hates because the Lord, the author of scripture is with us at all times. Today in the New Testament, we understand we're indwelled by the spirit of God and he will lead us and he will guide us. Even in the Old Testament, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. You can find that she will direct your paths. You can find that that's the way this works. So when you're thinking about the fear of the Lord today, recognize that this is a living, vibrant thing in your manuscript. I raised some questions about definitions. What is the fear of the Lord? Charles Bridges, one of my favorite old commentaries on the, the Proverbs, he defined it as, as that affectionate reverence by which the child of God bends himself. You get the idea there of humility, of repentance, of being impoverished in spirit, mourning meek. He bends himself humbly and carefully to his father, his father's law. The fear of the Lord has been described as the reverential awe of God that leads a believer to love and respect the Lord. If some well-known political leader we're here in our room, here in the, the room this morning, in the auditorium this morning. How would you respond to that leader? Okay. What if that leader were Vladimir Putin? You and I would go, ooh, oh, that's, you know, the Russian, the Russian leader. Or what if that leader were someone like Jim Jordan? You and I would be like, oh, boy, I'd love to get in. I'd love to shake his hand. I'd love to, you know, spend a little time with him. The fear of the Lord does not terrorize us. The fact is it, it attracts us to want to be close to the Lord in love, yes, respectful fear, but of love. It has been described as practicing the presence of God. It is an attitude and a commitment to love what God loves and hate what God hates. The verse I quoted for you a moment ago in Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13. The fear of the Lord means that one is concerned about the Lord's concerns and that he acts on those concerns. 
I absolutely, as I was studying for this message this week, I had never seen this quote before, but I thought that is, at the moment I read it, I thought that is exactly right. Oswald Chambers, who wrote My Utmost for His Highest, was commenting in another book on uh, the Pilgrim Songbook. He was commenting on Psalm 128 and verse 1 that says, Blessed is everyone that fears the Lord. Okay, stop the message just for a minute. Would you say, would you and I ordinarily say, blessed is the one who fears? You know, boy, I mean, those two just, they just don't seem like they, you know, kind of fit together. Well, that's because we have to look at the fear of the Lord as that reverential awe of respect that kind of draws us in. So Oswald Chambers was commenting on that verse, blessed is everyone that fears the Lord, that walks in his ways. And here's what Oswald Chambers said. He said, the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. He is exactly right on that. When you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear nothing everything else. Have you come to the place in your life where the fear of God is greater and stronger than the fear of man? You say, how would you recognize the fear of man? Okay, let's try it. What's everybody going to think of me? I wonder what everybody thinks about me right now. I, I, I I, I wonder if I measure up in their thinking. Now, you and I could say, well, that's characteristic of teenagers. I've met people in their 80s, and they're exactly the same way. They are very fearful of, well, what's somebody going to say? Or, you know, what, what is, what is, you know, what is, what do, what do you think everybody's going to say about this? I still remember when I came here, I was sitting on a committee. This is 28 years ago, 27 years ago. I was sitting on a committee, and I mentioned something I thought we ought to do in one of the committees. And somebody said, well, what's everybody going to think about that? What's everybody going to say about that if we do that? You know, what's everybody, what's, and I, I basically came to the place where I said, you know, people are going to say and do and think about what they're going to do. How about we do this? The Bible tells us that when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. How about we just concentrate on pleasing the Lord instead of trying to please all the people? And I re- still remember a couple of guys like, hey, that's an interesting way to look at that. Yeah, I mean... If you learn what by digging and by seeking and searching here, you find out what it means to fear the Lord. It's been described as practicing the presence of the Lord, loving what the Lord loves, hating what he hates, knowing what he is concerned about in each and every situation. Here's what you find out. You find out you don't, you don't have fear of anybody else. Why would you? I mean, you know the highest. You know the Lord And what he does is he crowds all those other things out of your mind. I remember when this happened to me like it was yesterday. I had made up my mind. I was really going to concentrate on meditating. Uh, I had uh, just the night before, for the first time, begun to discuss marriage with the lady who's now been my wife for these four decades. And I was so convicted when I got back to my apartment. I wasn't ready to lead a family. I wasn't ready to start a family. And, And I thought, Lord, help me here. And I got down on my face before the Lord and began to cry out to the Lord about helping me learn how to meditate. And what I found was, I found the fear of the Lord. It was within two or three months, I woke up one morning and thought, huh, when did I quit comparing myself with everybody? You know, when did that stop being a dominant thought in my mind? And I thought, second thing I thought was, how on earth does this happen? I mean, what what happened to me that I have this attitude? That's when I began to realize it was meditating on the scripture. And in meditating on the scripture, you learn the fear of the Lord. And I realized I have got to figure out a way to show other people the joy. Because you find in the Psalms, for instance, that the fear of the Lord can be imparted. It can be learned. Every one of us could learn exactly what we're talking about today. So if you just did a brief review, and it's there in your manuscript, of 
what it means to fear the Lord, you should just go through the book of Proverbs. It says in chapter 9 and verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning. There's that ABCs idea again, the beginning of wisdom, knowing the Holy One is understanding. It says in chapter 10 and verse 27 that the fear of the long will prolong your days. That's pretty remarkable. I love it in uh, chapter 14, verses 26 and 27, it says, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. You, you see what I'm saying about when you are kind of fearing others and you're a little fearful about what's everybody thinking? Uh, boy, what? Look, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. You get it? It says in the very next verse, it's a fountain of life. Who wouldn't want to learn the fear of the Lord? It tells you in chapter 15, verse 16, it's better than great treasure. It's the instruction of wisdom. By it, men depart from evil. What's happening in our society right now, there is, by and large, a decreasing or waning fear of the Lord. By the way, if I'm speaking to God's people this morning, dear friends, you and I need to learn once again what it means to fear the Lord and allow an entire society to see us as the salt and light that we talked about in last Sunday's message. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. It leads to life. The one who has it will abide satisfied. Would you like to have a life of satisfaction? Would you, would you like to be satisfied? The whole world is looking for satisfaction. Here's what it says in Proverbs. It says in chapter 19 and verse 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life and the one who has it will be satisfied. The fear of the Lord, by the fear of the Lord, you can turn away from being envious of sinners. Remember James talks about this. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. How do you turn away from that? The answer is the fear of the Lord. Second Corinthians 7, 1 talks about this. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So how do we get a hold of this ornament of grace then that we're talking about? It's, if it's like a jewel pendant, it's like these jewel chains. I just gave you a quick review because you could go on and on and on and on, all 31 chapters in Proverbs. I just tried to do a quick survey, and I'm, I am positive I left some things out, just going through Proverbs chapters 1 through 6. Look at what it says that Proverbs will do for you, and, and remember that this is what it's like. It's not like the law given by Moses. It's not like the interpretation of the law given by Samuel, perhaps some of the judges. It's not like the fiery prophet Elijah or Jeremiah saying, thus says the Lord. And it's really not so much like King David or Korah or Asaph agonizing and, and trying to put it all together. No, it's like a wise advisor comes along and says, hey, 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 open your eyes, man. I mean, just look around. You, if, if you would listen to my words and you would kind of look at life, you'd realize, hello. I mean, that's exactly the way it is. I mean, that's what life is really all about. Because Proverbs have this way of kind of coming alongside you and walking along with you. So what will happen? According to chapter 1 and verse 23, God will pour out his spirit to make you wise instead of being naive and foolish or scornful. You will dwell securely without dreading disasters. Anybody else here get their attention when you heard the locomotive sound this last week in the atmosphere? I mean, that was a very good indication that we had vortex winds of a tornado. It turned out it was a very mild tornado, touched down in Rawson. I was standing out on my front porch watching, listening, thinking, okay, that's, that's definitely tornadic winds. And all of a sudden, boom, the, the atmosphere goes to this bright kind of uh, yellow. And I thought, there it is. The dust, somewhere that tornado had touched down, and boom, you, you had it up there. But what did we do after that? Uh, we got down in our basement, and we had our supper down in our basement. Why? Well, that's the right thing to do in the middle of a tornado. I love it in Proverbs when it says, you will dwell securely without dreading disasters. You will be delivered from the clutches of immoral people. The Lord will direct your path. Catch this one. You will sleep peacefully. Wow, that would be nice. You will sleep peacefully. You will find wisdom that adorns you like an ornament of grace. 
What you find in Proverbs 1, 8, and 9 is repeated over in chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. You will find the straight path in life. You will learn to be diligent. Remember the passage on the ant in Proverbs chapter 6? You'll learn how to recognize and avoid wicked people. All right. Think about that one just for a moment. Okay. You're a young man. You're a young lady. And you know, okay, wisdom is like a woman. Folly is like a female. How do I recognize these people who are going to try to use me and manipulate me and twist me and catch me? How do I recognize that? It's like the, it's like the book of Proverbs kind of turns on your radar. I mean, it's like, it's like you get to live life in advance by going to the book, book of Proverbs and saying, oh, when I see that one coming, then I'll know. That's exactly what Proverbs does for you. You can learn how to recognize and avoid those wicked people. You will find a companion that speaks to you waking or sleeping. My time is just about gone, but go with me over to Proverbs chapter 6 because I love this. Proverbs chapter 6, again, very parental, speaking to us like a parent on this Mother's Day. Look at what it says in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 20. What are the first two words? Proverbs 6 and verse 20. Oh, not surprised, are we? The first two words are, my son, okay? My son, keep thy father's commandment, forsake not the law of thy mother, bind them continually upon thine heart. Just a passing note here. It is true that in the scripture, you will find that we, it speaks of, wisdom is applying God's word to your heart, you will also find that it talks about applying your heart to God's word. The idea here is bind it, sort of intertwine it with you, tie it about your neck. Now look at the blessed benefits here in verse 22. When you go, all right, you're in Sunday school today and you get ready to finish up around the noon hour and you go when you're, you're on your way. See, we're always on our way. We're always like, going, 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 going all the time. What happens if we do this right, what I'm talking about this morning? How would we know, yes, this is happening to me? Well, look what he says. He says, when you go, it will lead you. When you go, it will lead you. In other words, the scriptures are going to come to your mind. If you are saturating your heart and mind with the word of God, reading, meditating, one thing that's going to happen is when you're driving in your car or you're walking in your neighborhood or you're going to work, verses are going to start coming to mind and you will know, wow, I mean, this is speaking to me in real time. Notice what he says next. He says, when you go, it will lead you. When you sleep, it shall keep you. How many times have the scriptures ever come to your mind while you were asleep? You say, Pastor, I'm not really sure that happens to anybody. I am telling you it has happened to me and I've lost count of how many times it happens. What scripture is specifically anticipating here is that you and I would so saturate our hearts and minds with the word of God that when we are processing things, that the scripture would come to mind. I still remember years ago, there was a Nova documentary. And what they did was they put an EEG, an electroencephalograph on somebody's brain. If I remember correctly, it was Alan Alda. They, they put it on his, on his head. And he went through his day, went various places. And they took a recording of the signals of that EEG and said, okay, here's, here's what happened. Okay. Then they left it on while they went to sleep. Lo and behold, it was an exact replica of what had happened during the day. That's the kind of thing that makes scientists think, okay, here's what's actually going on in your brain. During the day, you're learning, oh, that was a mistake. Oh, hit my thumb there. Oh, be careful. I mean, that's, that thorn is really sharp. Various things that you learn during the day that what's actually going on when you sleep at night is your mind is processing all of those things. How much more beneficial then that we meditate in the law of God day and night that as we are looking into the scripture, we're bringing it into our thoughts. Because what he's specifically anticipating here in verse 22 is that when you sleep, it will keep you. He says, when you awaken, it will, it will talk to you. Have you had that experience of the very first thing in the morning? It's like the Lord uses scripture to say, 
good morning. How are you this morning? And you're like, hey, hey. you know, a verse came to mind. Hey, that's the Lord speaking to you. Verse 22 tells you that the word of God will guide you, guard you, and greet you. There's a quick three-point outline for a challenge next time you give it. That the word of God will guide you and guard you and greet you. This is what happens to us, all right? What are the applications on this Mother's Day? Would you be willing to make some commitments? First of all, would you embrace Jesus Christ by faith? He is the all-wise Son of God. Would you embrace him in order to embrace wisdom? Embrace him by faith. Faith has been described as F-A-I-T-H, forsaking all, I trust him. I'm trusting in his finished work alone for heaven. I'm trusting him alone, not good works that I do. But then, would you be willing to do this? And I have to tell you, what I'm getting ready to describe to you turns out to be one of the most pivotal commitments that's ever happened to me. I was 16 and a half years of age. There was a man named Frank Garlock. He's now 91 years of age, lives down in Pensacola, Florida. He was speaking at the Wiles at a conference where I was, and it was a morning session, and he was going through and talking about the value of the book of Proverbs. And when he asked us all to bow our heads, he said, now I'm gonna ask you to make a commitment. How many of you here would be willing to make the commitment? that you would read through one chapter of Proverbs every day for the next 31 days. I put my hand up. I didn't look around. I just put my hand up and said, I'm going to do that. Dr. Garlock said, two of you in this room raised your hand. He said, I believe God will greatly bless you for that. I don't know who the other guy is. And I'm looking for a girl is. I, I don't know who that is. I'm looking forward to meeting you in heaven. I can tell you that that revolutionized my life. It absolutely revolutionized my life. I've been saved about a year, and it helped me to really get a strong foundation under me. And then finally, would you learn what it means to meditate or concentrate on just one proverb? Think of it like this. Would you be capable of getting one thought every day out of God's Word? Just one. Just one. You say, you're asking me to read like, you know, chapters and chapters. No, no, one thought. And Proverbs is perfect for this. To go to that one proverb and watch the sage advisor that comes along beside you say, see? And you wake up and you realize, ooh, that's really, tr I can see that. I can understand that. That's the value. And it becomes on this Mother's Day like an ornament of grace, like jewel chains. Shall we bow our heads together? Lord, how we praise you for the way that you give us wisdom through the word of God. It really is so very attractive to us and it draws us in and we long for it. Lord, thank you for the way that you, you speak to us. It is not merely through fiery prophets who say, thus saith the Lord. And Lord, we need that. We, we need to think about those prophets as we'll do during our Sunday school hour in Jeremiah. But Lord, thank you for the patient guide and the advisor that just kind of comes along beside us and gives us wisdom and understanding. And Lord, I ask that as your people today consider making these very same commitments to read through one chapter of the book of Proverbs in these next 31 days, to meditate, to embrace you by faith. Lord, I pray that you would pour out your blessings on them. Fill them with wisdom like the wise woman of Proverbs. And we pray in Jesus' name.